Hello, you're listening to the Garden Organic podcast for September. I'm Fiona Taylor, and later on, I'll be joined by Chris Collins and also our head gardener, Emma O'Neill. We're regrouping somewhat after a long, dry summer, and we'll be spending some time talking about our observations of how that affected our own gardens, and we'll be answering your questions on what you can do now to restore your growing space ready for next year. In recent years, our friends and colleagues across the organic movement have initiated a campaign known as Organic September. It's designed to encourage people to put nature first in their shopping choices and to give a shout out to those farmers, food producers, smallholders and gardeners who are practising organic methods. Later on, Chris and Emma will be sharing some insights into why they chose organic horticulture in the first place. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. Why not check out their amazing range of organic plants and seeds? If you're a member of Garden Organic, you'll get 10% off. And as a podcast listener, you can get free delivery if you visit organiccatalogue.com forward slash POD5. But hurry, as the offer only lasts for a limited time. And if you're new to organic growing, we'll have a reminder of the five key principles of organic gardening that we live by at the end of the podcast. But first, I'm off to catch up with Chris in the potting shed. Hi, Chris. How are you? Yeah, it's been a, a testing year. I mean, in the 36 years I've been in a horticulture, this is the driest I've known it, to be honest. Really? With you. Really? Yeah, Good, yeah. Goodness I, me. I, I, I've seen yellow straw grass before quite a few times, but the length of the dryness has been quite incredible. And, you know, and just I'm, at the moment, I mean, looking around in London, the trees are already looking a bit autumnal. You know, we're in September, you'd expect them to go a bit longer. So that as, you know, yields on the allotment out of certain crops have been much lower. It's had a big effect. It really has. I found that obviously we were metering out water like lots of people and really thinking twice. And I, I mean, I remember last month we talked about you sure you look after your younger plants. If you're going to sacrifice other plants in terms of your watering regime, don't sacrifice the younger ones till, till they've got off to a start because I've got a well. I uh, know that's very, very unusual. It just happens to be the part of the town I live in. Mm-hmm. We share a well with our next door neighbours. Just, I just took the decision at some point to, to top up the pond. I just I couldn't bear it it just shrunk right down and it's been in for what six months and already it's got things relying on it you know and I thought I I can't let the birds down I can't let the dragonflies down I just need to I need to get this back up again Um, and the well water is exactly the right pH so we ran a hose and a pump off the well and 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 filled up the uh, the pond I'm so glad I did I felt like that was the right use of water Definitely. I think um, interventions are required. you just got to choose the ones you feel are important. You know, and I'm, I'm looking at young sort of trees in London and you think, well, they're quite resilient. If they're going to drop leaves earlier, I'm confident they'll come back next spring and they're the ones that have been there a little while. So you can kind of let that go a bit. You can let go of base of stuff that's going over early because it overwinters as root ball, give it a mulch next spring, give it a feed, it'll be back. But some things do require intervention, especially when, like you say, there's other nature involved. Some things have loved it, haven't they? I mean, I've got sunflowers that are, you know, absolutely rocketed. I mean, they're <laughs> yeah. fantastic. It's the best display I've ever seen. Yeah, sunflower. We've got a load on the allotment. Um, I did a mix of them and they've just been, well, you know, sunny summer, sunny sunflowers. They've actually had a ball, haven't they? They really have. Rebecca's, I've walked down the road today. There's all the Rebecca's in London, absolutely smothered in flower. Noreen's, uh, which are normally you see in the Mediterranean, flowers on them this year. And I associate them like a bougainvillea. I associate yes. them with being abroad. It's incredible how that, that this warm of temperatures, some things are reacting in a different way. And, and we have the, the garden at, at Ryter. We, we've got a patch of Jerusalem artichokes. I uh, can't wait for those flowers. They're, they're due out late September, but they're, they're already budding. They're, they're really tall. And of course, they're part of the Hellenium family. So it's a bumper year for them. I think it is one of those years where some things have done really well and some things haven't. In terms of food, definitely, I've had poor results from my spinach, my salad leaves, those sort of crops, because they just bolt in this heat. They go, well, they can't the, deal with it. Yeah, well, the conditions are bad. Let me set the scene. It's instinctive. On the other things, the more sort of Mediterranean stuff I've grown. Yesterday I did a crop. I laid it all out on the table. You know, there's melon, pumpkin, there's uh, grapes, there's raspberries that look amazing. There's cucumbers, courgette. The only thing that's I got that was a little bit temperate is I've got two beautiful cauliflowers, and I don't know why that is. But it just look it's all that sort of Mediterranean hardier stuff that's done really well this year. Yeah, that's definitely the answer. I mean, I I am afraid I left various things because I I was so enjoying the flowers. I'm not a good vegetable grower. I've decided because I get too excited about the flowers, and so I then 
let them run on and set seeds. So my artichoke flowers are just absolutely beautiful. I mean, what am I doing? You know, I, I could have had a really terrific crop of artichokes, but I got so transfixed by the flowers and how many bees I, I counted on yeah. one artichoke yeah. head. I counted 14 bees. I yeah, just, at that it. point, I couldn't bear to harvest them. <laughs> they are. The, the artichoke flower is a bee bar, isn't it? It really is. It's a bee bar. And I had the same experience. I thought, should I crop this and get a couple of little bit of leaves? Do I leave it to this amazing bee party that's going on? And so you do, you call those judgments. It isn't necessary to go around absolutely wanting to consume everything. As we know, we are big sharers of our gardens, aren't we? The other thing I've had amazing joy with is... Uh, it's hardy annuals. So all my, you know, I'm a big hardy annual man. They've been brilliant this year, but I'm watching them now burn out. I'm watching them sort of going a little bit early. They flowered profusely all summer. So for me now, it's kind of seed saving time. I know that I won't have to purchase those plants again next year, those seeds again next year. If I go around and I graze things like uh, the calendula, the English marigold, loving a mist, nigella, those really sort of common, even the sunflowers, all of those can be grazed. They might revert a little bit DNA wise to what they were before they were hybrids because I bought some hybrids. A good example of that is if I use aquilegia. It might be a bright red one this year, but it could possibly be purple next year because they can revert when you seed collect them. But that just means I've got all this sort of real, in a way, native or, or local stuff that I can graze off, put them in, dry them out on a tray, put them in the shed on the allotment, dry them out, then I'll bag them up, probably put them in a bit of Tupperware and they're all ready to go next year. So that's an interesting one because seed saving sounds like it should be really complicated and, and only something that experts can do. Um, and I must admit, I always look myself and I think, am I really going too early, too late? Is the seed ready to be harvested? Should I leave it? Oh, no, it's now rained. Now it's wet. You know, what? what is your advice for a basic seed harvest? Give it, yeah. let's, let's take an example. I mean, Nigella's a good one or Poppy. What would you do? I, I would give what I call, I'd go to what I call the straw effect. When it starts to brown up and look a bit strawy, even a little bit before that, and there's still a bit of green in it, I can then finish drying it off in the shed in, in cooler conditions. So that strawy sort of effect is quite important. Things like Poppy is quite interesting because obviously they have those rattles and they can stay green for quite a long time on the plant. But don't be afraid to cut them and store them because they'll grow brown and you'll know they're ready because you rattle them and you can hear them going. But in a general rule, I like to wait till that sort of strawy look. Then I know I can start. And I literally, things like calendula, I've got big sort of bushes and I go along with the hedging shears and I snap them all off and I rake them all up and I put them all on a tray and I let them dry and then I'll tap them out later. It's a good time now. It's been a hot summer, so they're going over a bit early. You can start to collect. I love this because we often talk about veg. It's just great to just stop and talk about flowers for a minute because we kind of take them for granted sometimes and, and especially things like nigella that will then set seed. And also, wouldn't it be great to be able to pass some seeds on to people as a Christmas present or something like that? You know, so I think it's it's great to talk about that and to, to, to hear actually it, it is quite straightforward and, and just sort of slightly can't go wrong from what you're saying. I know, though, with veg, it's slightly different, isn't it? We do advise people to leave peas and beans particularly on the plant as late as possible to, to do the, let it do its drying on the plant you get a better quality seed is that tr is that true yes that's good you can leave them on the plant standing I, I i put my beans on wigwams so i can leave them there or chop them down and just hang them upside down bound them in, in twine and hang them upside down in the, in the shed and let them dry there that's perfectly acceptable as well and they'll dry things like tomatoes you can get rid of the pulp put them through a sieve, put them out on tissue, let them dry a bit, and then Tupperware them. So there's various methods. It's not so difficult. Some things are trickier than others, but I think like most things with seed sowing, it's great to have a go. I've got lots of canna. That's why I was going to say, have a go. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. On my <laughs> lot, I've got loads wrong? of canna. I've got, and mostly people buy canna as a bulb, but I've got lots of seed, and, and that I think they need heat to stratify. If you stratify seed, you expose it to the conditions it needs for germination. So a seed will sit there until conditions are right, but we can preempt that. So with my can of seeds, I've got a massively hard tester. So you need a, a real extreme heat to break the tester to get it to germinate. So you can bake them in the oven and then I can stratify, stratify them and I'll see them if they'll germinate. I might not be successful, but isn't it just good fun to have a little go at it? This really is it. And when you get success, it's just such an amazing feeling. So saving seed is, is another form of harvesting, really. And and it, I did want to mention my fruit, which has done quite well this year. I've had a bumper harvest off my fig tree. Um, I've had loads of raspberries. 
How's it gone for you for, on the fruit front? Well, yes, I've had a little raspberries have been okay. I'm jealous if you've got loads of figs because they are the most wonderful fruit off the tree. But we've had a brilliant strawberry session earlier in the year. But I'm, I, I don't know whether to expand my fruit growing, but I have a minimal amount of fruit on the allotment. I don't grow that much fruit. I should maybe try to do a bit more. I did have a, I had a gooseberry on there. Turned its nose up at me this year for some reason. I don't know why. But I'll next year I'll give it a good mulch. Prune it out so it's all the centre and it's nice and open. In fact, last night, I'm going to boast now, Fiona, give, forgive me. I had a, a, a heritage tomato, mixed heritage tomato, raspberry and mint salad with a little bit of olive oil. All fresh Ooh. out of the garden. And it was, I had it with a bit of trout and it was fantastic. We were sat there last night going... Well, you know what? It's worth going down that a lot just for that. It really was. Have you ever put tomatoes and raspberries and mint together before? Well, well, no, it was not my idea. I have to admit, I did get it from a recipe book. And you even put salt and pepper on it as well. And I was thinking, nah, but it was absolutely really wonderful. Well, I think that's the thing you were just saying about your harvest being very mixed, you know, a bit of cauliflower, a bit of melon, a bit of this, a bit of that. Well, why not? Why not mix it up a bit? What are you looking forward to most in terms of what you might grow next year? I know the end of the season's coming, okay? So now my brain starts to think, hmm, spring. It's all about the bulbs. I love, I'm planning my bulbs. I get my brochure out and I look at organic bulbs and I decide what I want to prefer. So your mind is always six months ahead. And think about bulbs. They're incredible. Put in a galanthus, a snow, snowdrop in February. You've got them to flower. Then you've got crocus in March. Daffs in March and April. Then you've got tulips, April, May. Then you've got alliums in May, June. So you get this really long flowering season if they're planted properly. I'll then get my all my bulbs in, some wallflowers, some forget-me-nots on top of the bulbs in the containers. And I've got them my next spring all sorted out. And is there an order? I mean, you, you, you gave a very good list just then of, of, of what flowers when. Um, does that correlate? So should you put in the ones that flower first next year? Are they the ones to plant first this year or does it not quite work that way? No, I di- I'm dictated by size, really. And that's and depth. So the bigger bulbs, like the tulips, will go deeper into the pot. And then above that will go the smaller daffs. I like, I love the daffs like tete-a-tete and cyclamanus, beautiful little uh, daffodils. And then the crocus will go on top of galanthus. So it's dictated by size and that's how you do it. And then what you, and then there's no problem then to plant wallflower and forget-me-not or viola on top of that as well. And then you've got your spring bedding pot. Um, everyone says it's a bold lasagna in a pot. I disagree with that completely. It's a bold trifle, right? That's what <laughs> I called it a trifle years ago and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, I mean, it's a joy, isn't it, to think that you can get all of that into one pot. It's absolutely brilliant. Or a hanging basket as well. Sometimes I'll do a hanging basket where I'll plant my daffs, my tete upright and then on the sides and then facing down and you almost get like a firework, a ball of, uh, of flower. You, you can really play around with it. And the best thing about bulbs is that, you know, they're hard as nails. They really are. As long as the soil dry, drains okay, they're going to do their thing. It's interesting now because bulbs are one of the most toxic, chemical-ridden things you can buy. They've soaked it and everything. Whereas actually organic bulbs, we're a long way to go yet, but they're starting now to become popular. They're put in the ground in a field with other plants. They're leaving for six or seven years on a rotation. That length of time means that the pest and disease then becomes balanced so they don't destroy the bulbs and then they're dug up. So I'm looking at that now. There's lots of new varieties. So that's the way my mind is thinking. I've actually also, I shouldn't have probably done this, but the front of my building, all the shrubs had died because the builders put them in and they're useless. And I've got all my neighbours on board and I ripped them all out and that's going to be covered in bulbs and wallflowers. So I'll have a jolly good display outside the door next year. Uh, it's, it's a great time of year. I mean, September, I always do think of it as a, a little bit of a mini spring again. So I know it's a bit controversial, but I crack on and, and get some hardy annuals down. You know, I just think, why not? You know, they're hardy. Let's see if we can get them going. And, and it just gives me joy and hope, you know, to think of that. And I also think we should be thinking now about those first flowers of January, February that, you know, that's so needed, you know, for, for your, just your general sense of, of joy. Yeah, I think it's important to remember uh, as organic gardeners uh, that the more diverse our gardens are, the better. It's never about one thing. The more you can mix it up, the more interesting the garden is, but also it, it, it feeds the soil. It makes sure you don't have to water so much. So the more you can fill your garden, the more diverse it is, the more you'll have success as an organic garden. And then my last question, Chris, is I'm going into my first winter with my new pond. Yes. I don't have any fish in it. 
But any top tips about the kind of planting that I can make sure that there's still some sort of leaf cover or whatever there needs to be? Give me, give me, some, you know, ponds in the winter. What, what, what should I be doing? Well, if you've got marginal planting, I prefer to leave that as dead leaf, as straw leaf, personally, because obviously all those insects and all that wildlife can nest in there. They can get, it gives them cover for the winter. If you've got a tree near it and it starts to fill excessively with leaves, I'd maybe get the springbok or a lawn rake at the back of that, turn it upside down and fish out the excess leaves. But I do it quite carefully. And the good tip is, if you fish out leaves, leave them on the side of the pond for at least three or four hours so any wildlife in it can make its way back into the pond. And also make sure if there are frogs and stuff about, they've got access, a little corridor runway to get in and out the pond. But mainly, I would probably, if I was going to do a, a, a pond tidy up, I'd kind of leave it till early spring because all that sort of dead material will give excellent cover for the wildlife. Brilliant. Another case of less is more, I think. Like exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. All right, cheers, Fiona. Lovely to talk to you. And now, after all that chat about harvesting, seed saving and planning for spring, it's time to move straight on to opening the post bag. Chris and I are joined by Garden Organics head gardener, Emma O'Neill. So the first question, ah, gosh, drought. It's really been on all our minds, hasn't it? The recent drought hit my garden really hard. I lost lots of crops and plants as a result. Is there anything I can do now and throughout the autumn and winter to set me in better stead for next year? What do we think about that? Emma, have you got any thoughts? I think that the key thing is about soil preparation, really. So you need to have the right soil for the crops to be able to withstand these sorts of changes in temperatures. The climate change is very real. This year it's been a drought. Next year it might be that we're faced with flooding. So soil preparation is key. So adding plenty of organic matter to it during the autumn. Sowing green manures, you're still in time to sow those now. We've just sown some phacelia at the uh, demonstration garden here today. And also looking out for crops that you know can withstand um, certain weather conditions, really, or perhaps trying your hand at perennial veg instead. That could be a good alternative sometimes. So just to dig in a bit, ho ho, would you hmm. dig in that organic matter or would you lay it on the top? Well, that really depends on whether you are a no dig or a dig gardener. So as you know, personally, I love to dig the soil because I just like the feel of it and, the, you know, the way I, it makes me feel really. <laughs> but if you're no dig, you would put it on the top as a layer of mulch. If you like to dig, you can just lightly turn it over into the soil. But you don't really need to be digging it down because during the autumn and the winter, The worms and the microorganisms will take it down. The weather helps it go into the soil. It just depends on how fit you're feeling, really. And we talk about green manures a lot, but which ones would you recommend this year? If you're sowing it now, as I've said, the phacelia is good because it germinates quite quickly. And we found that actually it will germinate in this heat. Winter tears are quite good. Vetch, if you're no dig though, you want to try and um, use some that will you can chop and drop on the soil. We've tried that before with the rye grasses and buckwheat and chop them. Or alternatively, if you are going to use something like trefoil or clover, you need to chop them down before they start going into flower. OK, anything you would recommend, Chris, in terms of preparation for next year? Well, certainly Emma's right in terms of the healthier your soil, the more chance it retains moisture, retains nutrient, and those plants will will get through harder times. I had a massive problem with runner beans this year because I didn't get the moisture I should have given them because I was out of town quite a lot. They tend to struggle. So definitely attention to irrigation when the plants are young. Later, you can get up that good rule of watering deep and less often because the roots will get down then. But make sure you water them properly early in, in the early doors. And just hedge your bets. You know, this year, it's interesting, this year I've had massive glut of tomatoes, I've had um, peppers, chilies have been brilliant, um, I've even had melons on the allotment, And but the temperate stuff, the salad crops, the rocket, some of my root crops haven't done so well, brassicas, they've kind of failed this year, so I've kind of, the fact that I've hedged my bets a little bit means I'm still cropping and one thing I've noticed is that the, 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 the drop is coming sooner. When I say the drop, I mean the, the autumn. Things starting to finish earlier is definitely happening. So the drought wasn't too bad for you, unlike our listener who didn't have such a great year. What are you doing in terms of preparing your plot for next year, Chris? 
Well, certainly I'm planning. And hedging your bets is a good little phrase to remember. You know, if you have tomatoes, you have peppers, but you also have your temperate crops or mix and match a little bit because you don't know what the weather's going to do. But really, the, I mean, the horticultural golden rules have been set out by Emma. Soil health. And then I've said, make sure you irrigate properly at the start. But cheat, start thinking about it. If you feel a little bit down that your allotment or your garden is looking a bit sad now, don't worry. Nature rolls along. Get planning for the next phase. And um, it, it brings us into the next question, actually, from Felicity, who says, what should I be thinking about growing right now? So it's that time of year, isn't it, when when we, we kind of don't want it all to be over. You know, we want to have another burst. And I know, I know for myself, I do actually sow quite a lot in September, but then I've got a greenhouse and not everyone's got that. So how would we advise Felicity? What could she be thinking about growing right now? Emma, have you got any thoughts on that? Well, we've tried some peas. We have sown things like lettuce and chard, but because of the extreme temperatures, we have actually sown them in trays as opposed to directly so that I can keep them cooler. If you've had a wetter sort of climate, things like carrots, you can continue to successional sow right through to September. Also, things like chard and chicory, they will tend to stand. So that's what we're we're, uh, going for at the moment. Turnips, but... I must admit here, because the weather's been so hot and so dry, I have really abandoned all hope with my brassicas. (laughs) (laughs) Chris, what about you? What are you thinking about sowing right now or or growing? Well, it's quite interesting, um, Emma, saying abandoning the brassicas. And normally this time of year, I'd still be sowing salad leaves. And uh, I I mean, I even put runner beans in a month ago with, with hope that we'd get some rain and they would go. So I'm quite into continual sowing. But it's just my allotment is bone dry. If I try to rake it even, I'm getting I'm getting covered in dust. You know, my shoes are full of it afterwards. And as a gardener, you're part weatherman. And I'm looking at the situation now and I'm thinking, you know what? It doesn't really bode well for me seed sowing. If it was out my back door rather than allotment and I could get out there and water every day, if I had that sort of time, I might think about it a bit more. But um, actually at the moment, I'm holding fire and I'm hoping some rain will come. And then I might think about you know, sowing some winter crops and some maybe late salads, etc. But at the moment, it's just too dry. It makes the earth totally hard as well. I mean, you can't even, yeah, you can't do anything. You, you can't, can't. can't create a line to sow in. I um, I brought some um, late potatoes. Um, I thought, I'll have them. I'll have some Christmas spuds. I'll have some roast tatties for Christmas. And uh, I went down <laughs> a few days ago and I got my spade out. And I thought I'd trench them in and I, I can't dig the soil. It's that dry. I'd have to spend 12 hours soaking it to, to make it pliable and it's just not happening at the moment. And I, you know, sometimes you have to give way to nature. Yeah, and we've had to water our ground um, before we sowed our peas today because even just trying to dib in the peas, mm. it was absolutely rock hard. You do need to be mindful of your conditions, really, because otherwise the last thing you want is to be disappointed because you've, you know, you've put that work in, you've got that seed and then it, and it and it fails. Just bear in mind your conditions and go with that. And as Chris said earlier, the more diversity you have in the garden, the more likely you are to have some successes and then you won't be so upset about any failures that you get. I like what you said earlier about sowing in trays, giving you the opportunity to shift them around, look Mm. after them much more closely. And I know this time of year, I've had success with potting up some perennial herbs that then just quite happily go through the winter outside in in pots. So, you know, it'll be thymes, rosemaries, a a little bay. Sometimes I've had a a success with Italian parsley, just happily just, just carrying on growing gradually through the winter. I think that's that's great because it means you've always got something. You've got a little bit of something. You can go out and have a smell of it. You can go out and des- mm. get a few leaves and, and and they can just go on the top of, of your meal. And, and I think that for those of us who are in it for the joy of growing, it, it's great to think that actually if you have a couple of pots through the winter and you've got space for it, that's as good a way as any to sort of, you know, feed the addiction. <laughs> Yeah, and you can sow salad crops in pots quite readily because then you could stand them in a shadier, cooler area and they're more likely to germinate. The other thing is your perennial veg, so things like the Jerusalem artichoke, they've absolutely loved this and they will extend your cropping season. So there's a lot to be said for sort of, you know, mixing it up and, and trying as many things as possible, really. So this is a wonderful question we've got here. I've just started my first garden, which I want to manage completely organically. That's great to hear. What's the one thing you wish you'd known 
before you started. I love this. I think this is uh, this is going back down memory lane. Let's go to you, Chris. What's the one thing that you wish you'd known before you started? Well, I suppose in a little way, it's um, be prepared, not everything to go your way. You take it for granted that you, you have a knowledge and it's all going to go your way. And gardening just isn't like that. Like life, wisdom is born from error. It really does <laughs> sort of work that way. I'll give you an example. When I was a, a, a head gardener at Westminster, I wanted to grow some mechanopsis and it's a very dry soil there right in the centre of London and everybody said to me you fool Mr Collins you'll never grow mechanopsis which is a Nepalese woodland plant beautiful blue flowers so I put it in I sold it from seed even and I put it in and the first year it came up and it looked amazing and the second year never saw it again it just gave up its ghost so I just don't think you're ever really in control of the situation so don't be put off if things don't go your way obviously I'm going to say this do a bit of homework your soil's important, your aspect's important. Don't think you can just walk away for three weeks and come back and everything's going well. You need to give it your love every day. So just make sure you get those basics right. But at the end of the day, you know, have a go. Emma, what's the one thing you wish they'd told you before you got into it? Patience, patience and more patience. (laughs) So particularly when you're organic and you're under attack from pests, you need to get the balance right, you know, and, and you have to wait, really. You have to wait for those predators to come in and help you out. And also, I think it's a good thing to start with things that I consider quick wins because it boosts your confidence a bit. So I remember when I very, very first started, I sowed some carrots and absolutely nothing germinated. And I phoned up my old lecturer and I said, oh, the packet said so them in February and I've done everything right. And he said to me, Emma, it's freezing cold. Why would anything germinate? (laughs) And so I think sometimes, as Chris was saying, a lot of it is born out of experience. You know, don't always just look at the packet and think, I'll do it now. That's what it says. You will get more and more in tune with your own little microclimate and your own space. And as Chris says, just give it a go. What, what's the worst that can happen? You know, something doesn't grow. Try again. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we often talk about um, your garden as a system, that, that organic gardening is about encouraging an, an ecosystem of its own to develop. That is going to take time. That is going to take patience. That's also going to take the right kind of inputs from us to encourage things to happen all year round, you know, encouraging good soil health, good hygiene, sowing for success, you know, working your way around your plot, understanding your plot, but actually needs to have time to become a system, doesn't it? Yeah, very much so. And and everybody's plot is slightly different and everybody will have different successes. I mean, I, I think I've written extensively about my hateful relationship with celeriac, which I discovered is really hard to grow. <laughs> <laughs> and you think that you know you're an expert gardener I'm a head gardener I should be able to grow it well no you can't grow everything but I just think the fun of it for me is actually trying things and just when that when something germinates I couldn't be happier really. yeah well that buzz of, of getting a plant to grow that you didn't think you had a chance with is second yeah. to none and I kind of feel to be honest with you if I can encourage you to sow a seed and grow it then I've got you as a gardener I've got you and that's a nice way of looking at it I think. So from that enthusiasm and that passion that we all share um, I wanted to chat about the fact that it's organic September now. This is a time of year where a lot of organisations join together and promote organic practice and organic products and we always love to support organic september because obviously organic practice is at the heart of everything we do it's it's really interesting to think back to, to how you got into being organic in the first place bit of a a bit of a choice that a lot of people make chris i think you've got quite an interesting story here of what it was that turned you organic well it's, it, i think it's interesting that i mean and I, I mean i had quite an extensive um, training on gardening it went on for a long time and I and I think if you ask me to differentiate it was I think my earlier days of gardening it was very controlled it was very kind of you know you had you edged things and you clipped things and you were, you were very much kind of it was quite intensive gardening and my discovery for organic gardening or practicing it on a, on a professional level came at my time at Westminster Abbey because ironically it was budgetary the practices I was using say for instance applying lots of nitrogen I had lots of grass to look after lots of lawn areas so just you apply lots of nitrogen that's quite expensive. Uh, There's lots of paths, maybe we were spraying those. And I was thinking, well, hang on a minute, this budget builds up quite a lot of money 
And I'm thinking about um, plant physiology and the science I knew about it. I decided there must be an alternative way to do this. And so really, it was almost experimental at the beginning. What was there to lose? If I use different practices, will there be a different outcome? And actually, in a way, I let go. I let go a bit. I released a bit of what, what what I'd been drilled into me as a younger horticulturist. This huge myth that to be organic takes us all this extra effort. Well, I don't really agree with that. I think actually it takes less, you need less gear, less equipment. And that is what I found out. And that was, for me, the revelation. There were problems. I started going peak free. This was back in 2002. That was a, was a nightmare, to be honest with you, because we weren't as far down the road scientifically as we are now with peak free mixes. But on the whole, I kind of felt much more on the road to being organic. And it was a case of letting go a bit. I think that's a big part of being an organic gardener is not, not to interfere so much, but to observe. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, no, very interesting. And I think you would say the same, Emma. I mean, you and I have chatted and you said actually being organic is is easier. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I started out and my training was not organic. I generally hated spraying. One of the reasons was to do with the wildlife. Well, it's indiscriminate. That was the other thing I found. I don't think I realised initially you're not just treating the black spot or killing an aphid, you're damaging everything around you. And I have found organic gardening a lot easier. I mean, when I first started here, I was thinking, oh my gosh, how are we going to manage with the paths? Because that is something the public in particular do tend to pick up on. But once you start to sort of turn it around and, and you can get on top of it and you get in a good routine and it's about hygiene and husbandry and the soil preparation and having that right balance of plants, actually, it it takes care of itself. You're just like the caretaker, really. Nature is doing the work for you. It's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, I I remember that when I, in my early days of gardening, where I was just trying to figure it out for myself, you know, back in the 90s, and I, I had a little tiny garden and somebody gave me a rose. I was thrilled, you know first rose you know I've ever planted planted it fine you know went up the fence it was great but it uh, it got black spot so of course then I'm thinking right okay what do I need to do about black spot so then you look it up and people say oh you'd use this for black spot and so off you go to the garden center you buy the simple black spot and you spray it on your rose and then the black spot goes and you think oh brilliant then you know the next thing that comes along is that you've made a little pond outside the back door and then it's full of blanket weed oh what do I need for oh you need pond clear right okay I'll go and get them and before you realize it you've sort of got yourself hooked on troubleshooting and and going and buying products that are going to combat the, the you know what what you're dealing with and it was wasn't until I started started to grow herbs and, and, and my own food that I suddenly thought oh, hang on I don't want anything near any of this and I think a lot of people come into the, to organic gardening that way I think they think I don't want to be spraying anything that I'm going to be eating and then suddenly you go well hang on a minute what about what the birds are eating so then you did then it's sort of trickle trickle and you know the great big light bulb moment it's really an interesting thing that gardening has been sold as an uh, an exercise in troubleshooting weeds and slugs and and the enemy you know and 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 yet it just when you flip it as we all have done and the joy of of the observation of the wildlife that you're attracting into your garden you rejoice at the arrival of the ladybirds I'm gonna say I think initially though that you're very much sold on this English country garden with edges trimmed the hedge is formal things are in the right place and it's that kind of thing. And so actually you're looking and you think, oh, my God, there's a weed. And you react immediately. Whereas actually, I think once you become organic, you certainly go with the flow a lot more. And as we've discovered, some of the weeds are beneficial. You know, they provide pollen earlier on. And, and it's about that thing I'd said earlier about having the right balance. And what you get in an organic garden is you get so much more wildlife. I mean, in the summer, and I'm sure Chris is the same where he is, All you can hear is the buzz, you know, from all of the different insects and the colours are amazing and and produce tastes better. There's no way around that. It tastes better. It certainly does. And I think that being an organic gardener and, you know, all all this length of time I've been involved in gardening, I feel it's brought me closer to the subject matter than I've ever been before because it is observation. It is about acceptance that you're in an ecosystem. And it's I've always, it's always been in my soul, but it seems to be deeper than ever. And I, I kind of thank being an organic gardener for that in a way. What is a garden without the sound of bird life in it? 
or a mm. buzz of a bee. It's not a garden. It doesn't exist here. And I also think the idea, this firefight, which Fiona really eloquently described, yes. this whole thing about you're imperfect unless you buy this yeah. fire, it makes you lazy. I know people who will go, oh, it's May, I've got weeds on my path. I'll go out, I'll spray it all, and then I'll worry about it again in July. You're just dealing with it because you've noticed it for five minutes and then your attention somewhere else. And I, my, my recommendation is garden because you'll be amazed how much it just draws you in, how much it sucks you in and, and how much enjoyment there is from it. Now, I know we're, we're talking about gardening, but but I've thought a lot this month, particularly about our friends who are involved in organic farming and how much of a, a sort of mission they are on, on a much larger scale. And, and how much of a huge benefit that is, that actually the more of us who are adopting organic practice on whatever piece of land we've got access to, the better, the better for, for nature, the better better for the wider world. And, and Emma, when you're gardening, are you thinking of other people? Well, obviously, we've got the Heritage Seed Library here. We've also got the five acre community farm here. And we've got a training centre here. And so all of us are doing our own bit in our own way. And, you know, the pollinators and the beneficials, they don't distinguish between what's a farm and what's a garden or what's a tiny container. They're all doing the same job. And so any anything we can do to assist is worthwhile. And it joins it all up, doesn't it? Because then if yeah. we're doing our piece of land and then the farm and, um, and then maybe there's a school down the road or a community garden, all of us are serving the wildlife in that area. And if you could then sort of maximise that to think that that might be happening across whole counties or, or even the whole country and just think of the benefits for wildlife, this patchwork of organic practice going on all over the place. What a difference that would make to nature. Yeah, it's a good way to think of it, isn't it? Make up this whole quilt of activity, and that is, in a nutshell, if we can get that going, that's going to be our organic movement. Thanks ever so much. Great to hear from you. Thank you, Fiona. Thanks. Lots to think about this month, but I'd just like to stop and run through the five main principles of organic gardening that we always encourage growers to stick to in order to put nature first. Number one, build soil health. Add the organic matter in, sow the green manures, don't leave your soil bare. Number two, encourage biodiversity. Plant a wide range of plants, do all you can to help insects, birds and small mammals. Number three, use resources responsibly, especially water, energy, wood and plastic pots. Number four, avoid using harmful chemicals. You'll eradicate far more than the weed or the pest you're trying to address. And five, observe your growing area to keep it healthy, staying on top of problems that spread, such as bindweed or mildew. You can find more detail about organic gardening on our website at gardenorganic.org.uk. We always love to hear from you, so do get in touch with us via social media if you've any topics or questions you'd like us to cover. We are at Garden Organic on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. Our thanks again to our sponsors, the Organic Gardening Catalogue, and to Kevin MacLeod for providing the music. That's it for Organic September. Until next month. Music